And away we go. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Wherever you happen to be in the world today, welcome one and all to Coffee Talk. That's right, it is time for Coffee Talk Live. And you can find us live on YouTube at Coffee Talk Live and at Prep University Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as well as at Coffee Talk Chat on X, formerly known as Twitter, and fistfulofradio.com, podcasting out of Atlanta Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Friday at noon as we get ready to dive into the crazy world that we live in, take a look at the news and have a little bit of discussion. And of course, I do try to read as many of the comments as is plausible. And I'll go ahead and acknowledge some of the people who have chimed in thus far. I see Donna Beaver is here. Reminding people, thumbs up, like, and share. Please do if you don't mind. Helter is here. Brian is here. Dragon and Fluke Man have thrown in their hat, as it were, so far. And for those of you who can see, because I know some people are just listening, there is Daniel in the background settling in in the chair to keep me company as we get ready to see what is going on in the world today. And, of course, top news, the silly news is the eclipse the eclipse yeah and just mentioning it really quickly because some of you might remember that i put out a video i did it on both channels actually telling people yeah it's just an eclipse slow your roll calm down it's going to be okay it's not the end of the world because there you already know there is plenty of uh, people out there, especially uh, in YouTube, on religious and on prepper channels that want to act like it's freaking doomsday because there's an eclipse. And you don't know what's going to happen. I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's not like there's never been an eclipse before. I see Monkey has joined us today. Glad you could make it. But I put those videos out. And some of the backlash that I've gotten is that, oh, well, what about the comet? What about the comet? And I'll just open this up here really quickly. I'm not in the path of it anyways. I'm not in the path of it anyways. So I, I won't see anything where I'm, and I don't, I don't know if I even really care. <laughs> but, and this is a Forbes article. I pulled it up for, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just for the point of reference. It says, devil comet, diamond ring, and rare visual effects. Here's what else to know about the eclipse. And it shows the effective path here of where the eclipse is going to be passing over for, and I'm sure if you're in the air, an area where you're going to be able to see it and it means anything to you, you can find it. But the backlash that I got was, oh, well, you don't understand the devil's comet. There's the devil's comet is going to be all right. So throwing it out there just off the top of your heads. How many comets do you think are in orbit around the sun? Just throwing it out there. You don't understand. There's a comet too. How many comets? <laughs> Halley's Comet doesn't count because that's the most famous one. Well, you know, I won't wait too long here. I'll just go ahead and throw it out for you. If I remember correctly, in an elliptical orbit whereby a comet passes through the solar system, and is not in orbit in the outer solar system, it's 3,910. 3,910. Yeah, you know what? Just like solar eclipses and lunar eclipses are not all that rare, neither are comets passing by very rare. And in the outer, um, outer solar system, there's a ring of comets that are locked into orbit around the sun that do not come into the solar system and follow an elliptical path around the sun directly and then go back out and come back again. And they don't even know how many there are. That's 3,910. And that's just the ones that they've been able to number and catalog. Fluke Man says, saw the post about how women in the 50s dressed a modern day style. It kind of makes Muslim women in full burqa look more civilized. At least they don't look like they rolled out of bed in their pajamas. Yeah, 
the uh, a lot has changed and there's just no modesty anymore there's no modesty anymore and that's part of the problem people address any old damn way male and female they'll dress either very unnecessarily provocatively or just sloppy joe the ragman as they used to say in the military you dress like joe the freaking ragman today you look like a hot mess what the hell are you doing that's how most people dress and it's inappropriate i think and especially on the job and you see people on the job dressed like that i've seen walmart employees wearing onesies you know dressed in like the the zip up one piece pajamas with like crocs and putting the blue vest on what are you doing this is uh, you know i grew up in an era where that was unacceptable because the job had too much respect for itself to let an employee represent itself that way or represent themselves that way now it just doesn't seem to matter Nobody cares. Velvet Pilot says it's the first solar eclipse in seven years. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, no kidding. Well, it's not going to pass by where I am, so I don't even care. And if it was, I probably wouldn't be able to see it anyways, because I've been in position to witness a solar eclipse in the past and could not see it because of cloud coverage. <laughs> so whatever, man. What are you going to do, ladies and gentlemen? What are you going to do? That's the big story. But this story should be the big story. This next one that's coming up. And this one is going to be, is this the Daily Mail? I think this is a Daily Mail article. This should have people scratching their heads today. Daily Mail article talking about the... Uh, British terrorists who are being released, being released. All seven British terrorists who were co-conspirators of Al-Qaeda dirty bomb mastermind Tihren Barat are freed after serving just half their jail terms. It says thugs were caged for a total of 136 years in 2007 over a terror plot. So all seven dangerous terrorists Convicted alongside Al-Qaeda dirty bomber mastermind Dehrin Barat, if I pronounce that correctly, who wanted to kill hundreds of people in New York and London, have been released from jail. The British men, all part of a sleeper cell, pay attention to the wording there, British men, which means they had citizenship, all part of a sleeper cell that helped Barat plan a series of bomb plots in the UK and US are back on the streets despite being jailed in 2007 for a combined 136 years. Mail Online can reveal that the last of the group to be released was Abdul Aziz Jalil, the th uh, then 34, who was given a 26 year sentence and was thought to be a mass murder plot uh, behind a uh, plotter of Barat's minder. Barrett's minder. Okay. He pleaded guilty at Woolwich Crown Court to conspiracy to cause explosions between 2001 and 2004 alongside his fellow terrorist helpers who provided intelligence and support. And these are pictures of, the, of some of the guys. I guess these are their mug shots. I'll just cascade through that really quickly. He looks like he's high. This one. But these are the mug shots of the men that have been released. Uh, Mail Online investigations confirmed that all the group has been freed, with most serving less than half the sentences. Jalil was released, released in February 2024 after parole hearings. Last night, Chris Phillips, the UK's former head of the National uh, Counterterrorism, told Mail Online, This is madness. This determined gang of terrorists planned to kill hundreds of people in bombings on both sides of the Atlantic. Releasing them almost certainly with the same views they had when plotting murder shows how weak our society has become. Speaking specifically of the UK there, because that's where he is. They will not fear returning to prison as they intended to be martyrs. Our society can only be more dangerous with these men in it. And you've let how many more in since then? 
how many cells do you think are in the UK? Just asking. The group were part of a sleeper cell around Barat, a senior British member of Osama bin Laden's network and the mastermind behind the attacks, who was sentenced in November of 2007 to life imprisonment. Barat admitted to plotting to bomb the New York Stock Exchange, the International Monetary Fund headquarters, and the World Bank, among other targets. In April 2007, it was revealed that he planned to use limousines packed with explosives and radioactive dirty bombs for the attacks. And here's the other guys. These are the other men that have been released. Wow, he looks uh, he looks like his nose has been broken before. Just making commentary here, guys. His nose is twisted pretty bad. I'm willing to bet it was broken once. The rest of the mug shots as I cascade through. But yeah, uh, Great Britain, I guess they ain't worried about it. They released them, and evidently they are British citizens. I think they ought to have their citizen ship revoked it says the plans for an attack in london including blowing up an underground tunnel beneath the river thames or thames or thames thames i've heard it pronounced thames and thames to drown hundreds of commuters he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to murder and it was recommended that he serve a minimum of 40 years in 2007 the sentence was reduced nice you gotta love it you gotta love it. And Legends has joined us and says, also, I was wondering if on Prepper University you could do an episode on how to protect your property from squatters. Oh, my God. Don't let them start in the first place. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> don't let them start in the first place. you got to move them quickly and know what the laws are in that area. But, yeah, I know what you're saying because that's gotten to be an issue uh, in the U.S. recently because of the influx of illegal immigrants dragon says who knew it would be so difficult for a country to actually keep their citizens safe from violent and deluded people unfortunately we live on a planet where some creatures want to cause misery and fluke man says if they continue living in the west they'll get protection a uh, protection program courtesy of the taxpayers and donna says i suppose they'll keep their citizenship who knows Helter said the West is too weak and naive to get anything done or do anything decisive, sadly. There's extreme leniency towards people who will never be grateful, and they will, they will, I guess, harm anyone at the first chance they get. And 115 says, wait, I just got here. Did you just say they released people that were planning terrorist attacks with WMDs? Yes. Yes, they did in the United Kingdom, seven of them who were arrested and convicted of conspiring with an Al Qaeda leader to plant dirty bombs in the new in the New York and London stock exchanges and in the New York subway system. They they were going to pack limousines with uh, with explosives and blow them up uh, and the explosives were going to be mixed with radioactive material to create a dirty bomb. And they were given a, hundred, a combined sentence of 136 years, but they've been released. They've all been released now. And neither has apparently their citizenship been revoked because these men are British citizens. They're not British, but they're British citizens. And Legend says, never had that problem, however curious what your take would be on the subject. Oh, talking about uh, squatters, yeah. You've got to move them immediately before they have a chance to do anything or have a chance to make any claims. It's one of those things you got to nip in the bud. And, you know, a story here really quickly. When my wife and I were searching uh, for a home originally in the Georgia area, when we were moving from Illinois and coming, to, uh, coming here, we were looking at different houses. There was a house that we went to that had people in it, and they were not treating the property very well at all. And it, as it turns out, they were squatters. And when um, when I was on that property, it was a nice big piece of parcel of land too. And uh, the house, you know, it had it had potential, a fixer upper. And I looked around and I told the the realty agent, I said, you know, I wouldn't show this to anybody else. These people, they're not renting. I bet you that the property owner is trying to get rid of these guys, and they won't leave. They're not going anywhere, at least not without destroying the house first. And he was like, yeah, I think you're right, because this don't feel right at all. Um, but, yeah, you've got to get on that quick. 
you can't just have people hanging around on your property. Also, this should be top news. This next article should be top news. But yeah, that that's major. Those people, they ought to be, uh, if you're going to release them, you need to revoke their citizenship and repatriate them. Because uh, I doubt they were born in, in the United Kingdom. I doubt those people were born in the United Kingdom. I didn't read their names, but you know, the fact that the fact that the UK was even willing to do that and they were able to get out of prison after serving less than half their sentenced time for conspiracy to commit mass murder, and they would have pulled it off if they hadn't been caught. There was a plant, evidently. Somebody ratted on them. Just incredible. Just incredible. But as we mosey around here, next article is from the Atlantic. Atlantic. And title on that, the doctor will ask about your gun now. The doctor will now be asking you, apparently, if you have to go in for treatment about if you own or have access to firearms. More invasive questioning, courtesy of the medical profession, which in my personal opinion is not to be trusted, especially pediatricians I have a big issue with. And I had an issue with them way back when I worked with the Juvenile Justice Authority. It's a very, there's a very corrupt system there and you've gotta be really careful what you say and how you act. But again, the Atlantic has this article and they emphasize, if this will hold still for a second here, it's bouncing a little bit. The articles do that from time to time. A man comes to Northwest Health's hospital on Staten Island with a sprained ankle. Any allergy, the do doctor asks. How many alcoholic drinks do you have each week? Which um, the alcoholic drinks is none of their business either unless they seem to be inebriated. I can understand asking about allergies because they might give you a prescription. Next question. Do you have access to firearms inside or outside the home? When the patient answers yes to that last question, someone from his care team explains that locking up firearms can make his home safer. She offers him a gun lock and a pamphlet with information on secure storage of, and firearm safety classes. And all of this happens during the visit about an ankle. Northwell Health is part of a growing movement of healthcare providers that want to talk with patients about guns like they would diet, exercise, or sex, treating firearm injury as a public health issue. In the past few years, the White House has declared firearm injury an epidemic, and the CDC and National Institutes of Health have begun offering grants for prevention research. Meanwhile, oh, that must be nice. This Throw your money away. Meanwhile, dozens of medical societies agree, I bet they do, because that's where the funding is, that gun injury is a public health crisis and that health care providers have to help stop it. That is a very dangerous precedence that you're trying to set, trying to pretend like people getting shot are a health crisis. Back to the article, asking patients about access to firearms and counseling them towards responsible storage could be one part of that. Quote, it's the same way that we encourage people to wear seat belts and not drive while intoxicated or to exercise. Emmy, uh, Emmy Betts, an emergency med medicine physician and the director of the University of Col Colorado's Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative, well, that's a mouthful, told me that is the writer of the article an unsecured gun could be accessible to a child someone with dementia or a person with violent intent and may increase the chance of suicide or accidental injury in the home securing securely storing a gun is fundamental to the national rifle association's safety rules but as of 2016 only about half of firearm owners reported doing so for all of their guns well i don't believe that because that is a statistic 
And as you all know, statistics are a sham. They they hand pick, cherry pick five, eight hundred people and ask them a question. And that's supposed to represent all gun owners. Not true. Not true at all. I hate when they do stuff like that. And I see Heidi has joined us here today. Thanks for joining us. And 115 says, my ankle is broken. Doctors must be the guns in the house. Yeah, exactly. And Sven says, I think knives and blunt objects harm more people. I mean, if you believe the FBI. Yeah, and that is true. That is true. More people are injured or killed by blunt trauma or uh, slashing or stab wounds than by firearms. And also on those um, accounts, they lump together not just violent incidences or accidents, but self-defense and suicide, including uh, self-defense or necessary uh, action with a firearm by law enforcement, is all lumped into those numbers, and they don't they don't differentiate them. Helter says that they noticed some gun-related questions on their medical questionnaire for a recent uh, specialty visit. I simply checked off no on the first question asking whether I owned a firearm. And you got to be careful with that, too, because then they could say that you, uh, you know, if they start really enforcing that stuff, they could claim that you falsified a document. You've got to be really careful. 115 said they would freak out if they knew people who carry off and have a gun pointing at their particulars. <laughs> Hopefully the safety's on. But this is the um, this is the direction that we're going in, where they're trying to pretend like this is a safety issue, or this is something that doctors need to be uh, involved in, and prying further into your business, asking you questions that they have no no say in or shouldn't. But as I pointed out, because of public funding and because of bureaucracy and because of politics and social concepts being injected into the medical industry, they really are not to be trusted. You've got to be very careful. Sven said, outlaw all bats, kitchen knives, hands, feet, and scissors, knees and scissors, and water, outlaw, outlaw water too. California already did. Now, this i'm going to cascade this into another article that's on the same topic because at the same time that these articles started popping up that okay they are um they are now going to be encouraging across the board doctors to be questioning you about whether you have access to firearms which quite frankly is just going to piss a lot of people off mind your damn business they're either going to lie or they're going to get upset. Mind your business. I don't need a lecture. I know what I'm doing. Gee, I haven't killed anybody yet. Piss off. Leave me alone. And they should have a right to be frustrated because it's invasive. It's invasive. To You're not helping me. You're not helping me at all. I came here, like was pointed out in this article, I have a sprained or a broken ankle. And you're asking me if I know where somebody might have a gun. That doesn't make sense. But this, uh, you know, rolling into this article, and this is from the Arts Tree, Arts Tree article. Friends prevent friends from purchasing firearms. Here we go. This is going to be a big push for this in the next uh, couple of years. You know it rolls around every once in a while, but get ready for it again. In an innovative twist, major organizations focused on preventing gun violence are considering, considering leveraging America's tradition of public health advertising campaigns as a means to reshape the nation's relationship with firearms. And this is coming out of the Biden administration, by the way, because they're funding these projects. And they're also pumping money into the medical industry, which is why doctors are asking these questions now not because they give a shit but because they're being told to and they will obey because they don't want to be ostracized on the job back to the article 
This marks a departure from the traditional focus on policy reform inspired by the success of past campaigns that used advertising to drive societal changes, such as anti-smoking and seatbelt safety initiatives. With gun violence escalating and becoming the leading cause of death among young people, some advocates with the gun violence prevention movement are shifting their strategy from a top-down approach of changing policies to a bottom-up approach of engaging directly with the public. Now, here's the problem, okay? First of all, yeah, it is a societal problem, but the problem is with the people, not the tools. That's the issue. The problem is with the people, not with the tools. We have a problem in our society, and government is part of that problem. And their indoctrination is part of that problem. The media and public schools breaking up the nuclear family are part of that problem. People don't give a damn about anything anymore. So they don't care who they hurt. They're selfish and arrogant and ignorant. And all this is going to do is feed into it more. Secondly, and they mentioned the same things in the other article, and this is how you know it's all coming from the same source, even if different people are writing these articles and different news agencies are putting them out. Because they mentioned uh, smoking and seatbelts and crap in the other article, right? I didn't read the whole thing, but I read part of this or part of this concept. I'm going to read this paragraph again. This marks a departure from the traditional focus of policy reform inspired by the success of past campaigns that used advertising to drive societal change, such as what? Anti-smoking and seatbelt safety initiatives. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that right there? I'm going to dig this all up. And Delo is here, says they did not get a notification. Damn it. <laughs> I didn't get mine yet either, and it's already 27 minutes in. And Sven says Biden administration said bottom-up approach. Well, yeah. Well, you got to start at the bottom with the hairy legs in the pool, and you work your way up to smelling the hair. Fluke Man says the way things are going in the year 3000, socks will be banned because you can use it as a flail with a stone inside. There you go. Now, here's my issue with this. They're implying here that advertising helped people with smoking and seat belts. That's not what happened. Who remembers click it or ticket? Seat belts, everybody wears a seat belt now because in the mid 80s, they started the click it or ticket campaign where they watched for people, motorists, state troopers watched for motorists. And if it looked like they didn't have a seat belt on, they'd pull them over and write a huge ass ridiculous ticket for it. And after about a decade of that, people got the message. You find them until they gave in. Yeah, I guess it's not a big deal if I put a seatbelt on. Um, even though often people are even killed by the seatbelt, which is why they started making airbags. The seatbelt cuts you in half if you hit something hard enough. All right. Secondly, anti-smoking. Anti-smoking campaigns. Why don't people smoke cigarettes anymore? Because you outlawed it. You couldn't smoke indoors. If they started little by little, making it illegal to smoke inside anywhere. Because it used to be smoking and non-smoking. And hell, I'm old enough to remember uh, growing up in the 70s when we would go to the supermarket and people would be walking around with a cigarette in their mouth. In the store. Because nobody gave a shit. That's just the way the world was. They made it illegal to smoke inside. Then they made it illegal to smoke within proximity to a business. Then they raised the hell out of the taxes on cigarettes. And guess what? People still smoke. They call it vaping now. Just because people aren't smoking cigarettes doesn't mean they're not smoking. Now everybody freaking vapes because that's the next new big thing. Or they're smoking weed because it's been getting legalized all over the place. And even places where it's not legal... It's everywhere. I've pointed out many times that I walk around on the street, I can smell weed. It's ridiculous. Anywhere we go, we can smell marijuana. Parking lots, Walmart. Uh, it's a supermarket. Kroger smells like marijuana somewhere. People are still smoking. They're just doing it differently. They're still doing it differently. 
and th so advertising campaigns did not stop smoking and did not encourage people to wear uh, seatbelts. This is a lie or this is equivocation because there were campaigns at the same time, but that's not what caused a switch by any means. That is not what caused a switch. That's not true. That's equivocation, that article. And this is the, say, the same garbage in the other article that we just read. Same garbage. So we're going to, so, uh, basically what you're suggesting to me is that on the slide somewhere they're going to start trying to fine you or tax the shit out of you for having a firearm. And then they're going to pretend like it was campaigning. 115 said people still smoke and people still drive without seatbelts. People still text and drive. Yeah, exactly. And that's a huge one. People still drink and drive. Laws don't stop criminals. And there it is. I just now got my prompt. It is at the 231, it says here. So at the 31 minute mark, at the 31 minute mark, I just got my notification that I am live. Thank you, ScrewTube, for letting me know. Legend says their dad, who was born in the 60s, remembered when seatbelts were brand new. He said nobody liked them and would just ignore them. Then, as you said, a click it or ticket was formed. That's right. And there's an argument for this. And this is what I read on the subject, getting the seatbelts here really quickly since we brought it up. I'll go down a little bit of a rabbit hole on this one. That you are just as likely to survive a crash without a seatbelt as with one. But one of the main reasons that they wanted seatbelts, it makes cleanup easier after an accident. If you got uh, crushed to death in your car, they can move the car and and dig you out of there off the road so that traffic can continue. If you got thrown out of your car, now you're all over the road and it's going to be closed longer. And that was primarily one of the main reasons, but they they disguised it as a safety concern when they first started doing the seatbelt thing. But they'll never admit that. I read a, um, some articles on that some years ago that the real reason behind it was they did, uh, it was easier to dig you out of your car than it was to clean up road pizza, dead or alive. That you were just as likely to survive a crash without the seat belt. And in some cases, being thrown from the car might save your life. 115 says the gun stores in their area smell like weed. Oh, no. And Sven says their gun store won't sell to you if you smell like weed. Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. And as we shift around here, this is another big one. And it's uh, something that we've hammered the hell out of in the past. And it has to do with EV, electric vehicles, and the Biden administration, again, with more regulations on electric vehicles, this time attacking the trucking industry. This particular article looks to me like it's going to pander. But, you know, we'll still talk about it. And this is from the cool down. Yeah, this is definitely going to pander, I'm sure. It says, Biden administration announces new standards with sweeping impacts on the trucking industry. Another giant step forward. Oh, yeah, they're going to suck up. So on March 29th, the Biden administration announced the finalized air pollution standards for heavy-duty vehicles as part of a combined effort to reduce pollution produced by the transportation sector. The new rule limits the planet warming gases produced by heavy-duty vocational vehicles such as freight trucks, garbage trucks, school buses, delivery trucks, and public utility vehicles for model years 2027 through 32. The standards will avoid 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions and provide 13 billion in annu annualized, annualized excuse me, net benefits to society related to public health, the climate, and savings for truck owners and operators. Savings? Okay. The Environmental Protection Agency stated in a press release. Yeah, that's a lie. The regulation will dramatically reduce toxic air pollution that directly impacts over 72 million Americans who live near truck freight routes. 
most of whom live in low-income communities. Oh, please. Please don't start that low-income community garbage. Quote, exposure to traffic-related pollution is a serious health hazard to those living in communities with heavy truck traffic. Harold Wimmer, president and chief executive of the American Lung Association, said in a statement per the New York Times. Chronic respiratory and cardiovascular disease are among the many adverse health effects linked to constant exposure to high levels of air pollution. Oh, you mean those two diseases that existed before we had motor vehicles? The standards will avoid 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Let me see. Let me catch up to the right spot here. Okay, according to the EPA, the transportation sector is the largest source of planet warming air pollution in the United States, and heavy duty vehicles are responsible for 25% of the pollution. Tell that to China, tell it to India, tell it to Eastern Europe, tell it to Africa, tell it to South America. Why are we always the ones? Gases like carbon dioxide and methane act like a blanket, heating up the earth in an unnatural and unprecedented way. The rapidly rising temperatures are directly connected to increased extreme weather, events like severe storms, worsening wildfires, and devastating droughts. I don't believe that. I really just don't. Um, let me see. It also says that um, progress is being made as for the Inflation Reduction Act provided $1 billion for electric trucks, including tax credits for companies that buy them and subsidies for changing infrastructure it goes on here to imply that getting them to convert to electric vehicles is going to save them money in the long run i don't believe that and we've already seen this we've read several articles on these subjects over the last couple of months you might remember the electric snow plows in new york or the electric buses that we read about in several states these entire fleets of trucks are mothballed because they don't work. Electric uh, snow plows break down. They can't operate in cold weather. They can't handle pushing the snow. They're not strong enough. They don't have the torque, the power, or the longevity to do the jobs that they're set out for. There's fleets of electric buses, school buses, sitting there collecting dust, mothballed again because they can't repair them these vehicles cost an average of three times what their gas powered counterparts typically sell for number one and the maintenance costs are nearly 10 times as much they're sitting there talking about they can't uh serve one bus i remember i think this is alabama right they had one bus sitting there because the door doesn't work and it would cost like five eight thousand dollars to replace it if they could even get the door, which they can't. It's extremely expensive to run, to operate, and to maintenance these vehicles. And they don't work in cold weather. They don't travel even a quarter of the distance of their gas counterparts, and they cost three times as much. Who's saving money? This is a terrible idea. These trucks aren't going to be able to pull the weight. They're not going to be able to do it. Monkey says another giant step forward towards the unemployment line. No kidding. And Sven says they're in a, we're in a carbon deficit. We need the carbon. And Paul is here, says uh, nothing for the ships and their jets, though. No. Yeah, and again, if this stuff worked, they would start within their own infrastructure. You'd see the military doing it if this worked. You would see electric tanks, electric jets. You would see electric battleships. Where are they? Where are they? It's been tried. It doesn't work. The stuff's way too heavy and way too slow and way too inefficient. Again, too expensive to operate, too expensive to manufacture, too expensive to maintenance. Uh, Dragon says more electric buses and trucks by 2027 means more trucks and buses stuck on the side of the road. No kidding. Paul said NASA said we need more carbon dioxide. Well, well. I'm sure if they get enough money, they'll change their change their tune. And Helter said the same hypocrites fly around the world in aircraft that put more emissions in the air than one trip, than one truck or car does in a lifetime. Exactly. There, and again, like I said, where's the electric uh, 
Where's the electric jet? Show it to me. They can't do it. It won't work. It simply will not work. They know it won't work, but they're pushing these agendas. And it's like, you know, I can understand if you perfected it and it works. Hi, we perfected the electric vehicle. It'll run for 500 miles. It'll pull the same weight as your average truck. It won't shut down if it gets cold. Okay. But they can't produce it. They can't show it to you. And again, like I said, it costs on average three times what the what the standard uh, diesel versions cost. Three times as much. And then the maintenance costs are insane. And then you need a whole new crew because obviously a diesel mechanic cannot work on an electric uh, on an electric truck. So that guy's out of a job. And you're going to have to hire another crew who's specializes in electric vehicles and hope you can get the parts and hope they won't be too expensive. Again, parts and labor on these things are nearly 10 times what it would cost for their gas counterparts. It's insane. If it costs you $500 to get something fixed on a diesel engine, it's going to cost you almost 5,000 on an electric vehicle. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Fluke man said there were rumors China China stuffed cotton balls in their pollution detection devices and covered uh, greenless mountains with camo nets to fool researchers and visitors. I never heard that. And Sven says uh, semis would be too heavy. It's all crap. Yeah, some of those trucks, the weight, the weights on them are crazy. You have no idea. Can you imagine a logger, a logging truck, electric? <laughs> I don't even know if they could get it started. <laughs> Those things are insanely heavy. That's um, that's why they don't like to go out on the freeway. You usually see uh, logging trucks sneaking around where they shouldn't be. But yeah, uh, again, the, the weights that are carried by those tractor trailers, an electric vehicle would not be able to handle it. They'd have to reduce the size of the loads. That's going to cost more. This is going to cost, I mean... They, they can try to bamboozle these trucking companies and these other companies with subsidies, giving them a bonus for doing it and giving them a tax break for a couple of years. In the long run, it isn't worth it because this is why a lot of uh, places tried this in the first place. Like uh, the couple of articles that we read about electric school buses that um, the fleet has been locked up in the garage now because it's useless. Or... Like I said, the electric snow plows in New York that did not work. But then they, New York will still spend uh, billions on electric school buses. And all the small town mayors and everybody all around New York, uh, New York State, are complaining about it. We don't want electric buses. We don't want them. Your plows don't work. What are you going to give us electric buses for? Are you kidding? Do you know how much it snows out here? That makes perfect sense. They're not safe. They're not safe and they're too damn expensive. But they've got an agenda, and they're going to force it on you. And Sven says if they want to rescue pollution, everything would be diesel electric. And you can do a hybrid. I had, I wish I still had it, actually. I had a Mercury Mariner, and it was a hybrid, and it had a combination engine. It was an electric and a gas engine. And the electric engine charged itself every time you applied the brakes. And I, I probably put like 15 gallons in that thing every two weeks. It was great. That thing was great. I don't have it anymore. Unfortunately, I lost it along with a lot of other things back in the day when I was in trouble with my exes. But um, that was a great car and it makes sense. You know, it just it the electric engine just complements the gas engine to give it a break so it doesn't burn as much fuel. Made sense to me. A hybrid engine, I like that, that it, and it worked. And Paul says there's loads of fields in China full of electric cars. I wouldn't be surprised. And Brian made a donation to the channel. Thank you, Brian. Very much appreciated. Daniel, thanks you. You see Daniel sleeping in the background. Hey, Daniel. 
Daniel is knocked out. Daniel is knocked out. But thank you very much, Brian. Any help for the channel is always very much appreciated. And Fluke Man says, uh, once said something like climate activists want the military to use environmental friendly vehicles, but it's okay to blow the shit out of enemies. Yeah. Maybe they should go back to using horses. <laughs> Pull all the equipment with horses. Actually, they were brutal on the horses in the in the military. I don't even want to think about it. If you love horses, you don't want to know. If you ever watched the film War Horse, it does a... Um, it has a great example of how those animals were treated during that time. But it's one of those films you'll probably only be able to watch once. It was good, but you won't want to see it again because it's very sad. Brian says he moved his paw when I said his name. He knows his name, although he's weird. Uh, you know, bunny trail here real quick about the cats. Any of the other cats, if they're awake... If I call their name, they will come to me. And you've seen me, like if I see somebody walking by in the doorway and I'm like, come here, uncle, or come here, granny, they'll come to me and I can pick them up. If I call Daniel, he runs. He runs away. And if you try to, come here, Daniel, come here, and he backs up and then he runs. He wants you to chase him or something. And then, but if you sit down or you go to bed, especially if I go to bed, there he is. He's walking around on my shoulder, curling up in a ball, rolling around. He digs his face under my arm because he wants my arm over him. He wants me to hold him like a teddy bear or something. So if I'm laying there, he walks around all over me and then he shuffles himself under my arm. That's what they do. <laughs> and 115 says they saw an airplane cast a shadow on the sky. It was one of the most strange things I've seen in a while. Interesting. But yeah, you already know how I feel about the whole electric. I hope whoever gets in office next undoes some of that because it's really damaging American infrastructure. And all it's going to do is push all those jobs overseas because they're going to be able to do more cheaper. Why would you want to do anything here when you can do it cheaper there? And the less that you have to move things around here, the cheaper it's going to be. They're killing the industries. It's going to raise prices for stuff that is sold in the United States. Um, like, you know, again, I used to work for Frito-Lay. I could see local route drivers maybe having an electric vehicle uh, just going around to put their stuff up in the convenience stores or whatever. But those over-the-road trucks, forget it. Forget it. They'd have to reduce the loads and it's going to cost more in the long run. And then if you have to go anywhere with an incline, because I know um, Denver has a plant. There's a Frito-Lay plant in Denver, but it's not very extensive. And so they ship stuff to Denver. When I worked at the Topeka plant, we had certain product that was designated for Denver. And those bags were the low air bags, because you know how the chip bags are full of a lot of air. And the reason they do that is because that's a big complaint how come it's only like about a third full what the hell um if when they did fill the bags all the way the chips would all get demolished they, they get shattered so they put a lot of air to give it some room to move around or it's not air it's actually nitrogen that they pump into it because the nitrogen keeps it fresh longer but when they have to send it to colorado they put half as much air in so the bags are kind of squishy because when it goes up the incline into, into Colorado for the chips that they cannot manufacture there for whatever reason, um, the bags expand. So if there's too much nitrogen in the bags, they'll blow up in the truck. Or burst open, rather. They're not going to actually blow up, but they'll burst open and the chips will be worthless. But there's a lot of product that gets trucked into Colorado that they can't do there. No electric truck is going to make it up those inclines. I've been to uh, I've been to Denver. Forget it. Sven says the big three is dumping electric. The administration is pooping themselves. Yeah, they are. They've been walking away from it. As we shift around, we're going to shift gears. Shift gears. No pun intended. 
State of the Union. Saw this coming a mile away. Had to happen eventually. State of the Union article again. Governor makes hard drugs illegal again. In complete U-turn of liberal policy. And of course, you must realize where this is. Who knows where this is happening? This would be Oregon. So here we go. It says, Oregon has reversed its 2020 policy decriminalizing small amounts of drugs after overdoses and addiction sharply increased. A new law signed by the Democratic governor makes drug possession a misdemeanor, misdemeanor again and allows police to confiscate the drugs. It aims to divert people to treatment instead of jail. Oh, well, that won't work. Don't even get me started. The initial 2020 measure was passed by voters, but later disproved as fentanyl as the fentanyl crisis grew. Quote, Republicans stood united and forced Democrats to do what Oregonians, 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 that sounds terrible, demanded, recriminalize drugs, Oregon House Representative Republican leader Jeff Helfrich said. Democrats and Republicans both introduced bills to roll back the policy. While Republicans supported the change, some said more is needed to address the drug crisis. Yeah, now you you let it get out of control. Now you want to fix it. It's not going to be easy. Make no mistake, quote, this bill is not enough to undo the disaster of Measure 110, Representative Tim Knopp said. He's right. House Republicans are ready to continue the work. We started and bring real change to Salem in the next session. Real change, real change. Now the governor has given the recriminalization bill her stamp of approval. We can finally end the chapter on Oregon's experiment with recriminalizing hard drugs. You know what I think of whenever I hear change? They said real change and I made fun of it. It makes me think of cheers. If, you, if any of you remember the last season of Cheers, the, uh, the last season of Cheers, when as an experiment, Frazier ran Woody for mayor just to prove that he could. And it was supposed to be, you know, he was supposed to rescind from it. But then Woody said, no, I want to be mayor and, and finished anyways. He was supposed to back out after Frazier proved his, his point because it was done as an experiment that he could run anybody for mayor, but then Woody decided he wanted to do the job. And Frazier's mindset at the beginning of the episode was basically, or the beginning of that format, because it was more than one episode, I believe. All you have to do is sit there and whine about change, and people will vote for you, just like Clinton. Watch. (laughs) <laughs> and he was right. He was right. Uh, Dragon says, having the Oregon legislators and the governor passing and signing the bill is like washing and waxing your car after you totaled it. Exactly. Thank you, Dragon. That's a good one. Helter says, create or make a problem worse so we can fix it, U.S. government. Any government. Most governments. Any government. So here we go. Uh, HB. 4,002 is not a perfect solution. No. Legislators will have much more work to do in upcoming sessions, but it sets a standard for how the state should approach the drug addiction crisis by empowering law enforcement and our behavioral health system to work together to help Oregonians struggling with chronic addiction seek life-saving treatment, he said. They don't want to seek treatment. That's why they're drug addicts. This is the part that kills me. They're not trying to put these people in jail. They're trying to put them in drug treatment. This is where they're going to screw it up. I almost want to cuss right here. Trust me. (laughs) I almost want to cuss there because that doesn't work. Now, here's the thing. If you put them in jail, they're getting drug treatment anyways, by force, long-term, cold turkey straight up. Once they get their head clear, they may want to stop. If you force them into a drug treatment program, they don't give a shit about that. They don't work. They don't work. And you guys have heard me go on and on and on about this. I've taken college courses for drug treatment and drug counseling. 
and I've worked with a drug treatment facility when I was with the Juvenile Justice Authority. They do not work. The treatment facility says it didn't work. This shit doesn't work. <laughs> These kids will be back in here again and again and again. It doesn't work. The textbooks at the college said that it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work and that it's not a disease. And that's my big thing too, is it said literally in the textbooks that it's not a disease, but we tell people that it is because it helps to keep the family in invested. So we're going to lie to the family to keep them invested so that they can keep getting hurt by this person. That's bullshit. That just pisses me off. I, that's, I gotta that's, uh, add that to my long list of pet peeves is how that's all such a lie. Those people are not going to do right unless you force them and stay over their shoulder indefinitely or they have a change of heart. That's why you hear people will tell you that have been in, uh, in drug services. And I've heard this, not exaggerating. Oh, well, you know, I, I was in a drug treatment program 43 times. <laughs> Why were you in, the four, in there 43 times? Because it doesn't work. And when you got out and you got your little certificate and they gave you a little pat on the back and your kiss on the cheek, they started using it again within a couple of weeks, if not the next day. It wasn't until Mr. 43 uh, times in drug rehab decided, I can't live like this anymore, that it stopped. That's when it stops. When they say, okay, I'm done. I can't live like this. That's, that's how they do that. That's when it's done. Fluke man says, I guess collecting taxes from drug dealers aren't as profitable for moral businesses and their employees. Well, that's why they're trying to legalize a lot of it. And Sven, with their pun, well, that's Salem's lot. Yes. Brian says some girl at their job has a brother who has a smoking habit. She said it's a disease and that it's none of her, none of her business. Yeah, they all say that it's a disease. The disease is your mindset. Nothing forced you. I've never smoked. I've never smoked. Can I catch it from you if you smoke? Oh, crap, that guy smokes. Now I think I need a cigarette. No, it doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. The disease is your state of mind, and that's not a disease. That's not a disease. I have a big issue with that. I have a big issue with that whole thing about the uh, about how that's hand handled and approached. Even the insurance companies know that drug rehab doesn't work. That's how you graduate from uh, drug rehab because the insurance runs out because they'll only pay for so much. And then they're like, all right, you're done. Get out of here. I've had people, clients, when I was with juvenile justice, test dirty with like two weeks to go on their drug rehab program and still graduate because they graduated on account of the insurance company refusing to pay for any more treatment your time, and I forget how many weeks they pay for, but the time was up and the council was like, yeah, well, they're, they're not going to let me keep them. I'll, as a courtesy, I'll, you could bring, uh, bring her to me for a couple more weeks and, you know, I'll try to talk to them, but, uh, yeah, the insurance company until they get caught again and put back in the system, they're not going to pay for any more treatment. And that's again, because they know it doesn't work. And Sarah says, cancer is a disease. If you can stop your disease, then it isn't a disease. Yeah. And mothers over St. Jude's wishing their child can stop their disease. Yeah. And you can stop smoking. It may not be comfortable or easy, but you can stop smoking. You can stop drinking alcohol. You may not want to. It may be uncomfortable. You may go through DTs. But you can't stop. So, yeah, I totally get your point there, Sarah. But with that, we are at the top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and start signing off. Again, you are listening to and or watching Coffee Talk, and that is at Coffee Talk Live or at Prepper University on YouTube, simultaneously broadcasting at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday, as well as at Coffee Talk Chat on X, formerly known as Twitter. And uh, Sarah says, former drug addict, sober 27 years. Good. 
good. I'm glad you were able to get away from that because it's a terrible life. It really is. I've seen too much of it myself. I've never used any narcotics, but I've been exposed to a lot of it, including my own mother. And Fistful of Radio, fistfulofradio.com, podcasting out of Atlanta Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Friday at noon. So thank you once again, everybody who was able to join us here today. Special thanks to Brian, who made a donation to the channel. Always appreciated. And again, I hope everybody got something out of the conversation. And we will catch you 